Welcome to another episode of Bitfinex Talks. I'm your host, Ricardo Martinez. Today, I am here with Spartacus Rex, a developer from Minima. Uh, Spartacus, how are you today? I'm very well, thanks. Thanks for having me on the show. It's my pleasure. To get the interview going, my first question is, what is Minima? Uh, what problem is Minima designed to solve in blockchain? Um, so Minima tries to address the one issue that I have with the entire current crypto space at the moment. So I, like many other people out there, fell down the Bitcoin rabbit hole, you know, over a decade ago now. Um, and, you know, it is absolutely world changing stuff. This is this is the stuff that is going to be the future for our, you know, for our children and for their children, et cetera, et cetera. But when I look out over all the different blockchains out there, I feel that they are missing one crucial element. Um, and frankly, this is the decentralization bit. Yeah. And so what I see when I look out there is that all of the current blockchains seem to be they start decentralized, but they have what I consider to be emergent centralization. What I mean is that there are bits of them. You know, a system is only as decentralized as its most centralized bit. So it doesn't matter if 99% of the chain is or the things you do are decentralized. If 1% of it requires this thing, then that is how decentralized your chain is. You know, and we really need decentralization. You know, without the decentralization, there's no point using a blockchain. Um, and this actually applies to, you know, everything. It applies to Bitcoin, Ethereum, Polkadot, Solana, a lot of them. And in fact, I, I suppose what is even more, you know, uh, sort of apparent to me is that it's become less important. So it was really important to begin with. And that was the thing that mattered. And then, you know, Ethereum's come along and they sort of thrown that out of the window to give us, you know, bigger blocks and better, better scripting and more power and all of this. And then, you go up to Solana and they're like, well, look, forget about that. We're just going to have 100 people doing it, you know, or whatever it is, uh, or near protocol or whatever. Um, and for me, that is the that is the only reason that you should be using a blockchain if it is decentralized. You know, for, for Bitcoin, it's, it's the mining. It's the mining centralization. You know, mining is an industry. It is a business. It is a very cool advance. You know, there's all of Bitcoin is fantastic. And anybody who doesn't love Bitcoin doesn't love crypto, doesn't get it. And I love Bitcoin. But when I see the mining industry, I just see an industry like any other mining industry. And we've seen this game played out, what, 10,000 times already. And we know how it's going to end because it always ends the same way. It always ends in a monopoly. That's what happens. And I've not heard a cogent argument yet as to why that isn't what is going to happen with Bitcoin. And the problem with winning the game of Bitcoin mining is that when somebody wins that game, Bitcoin dies. Yeah, I see this, you know, how we're going to have America doing lots of stuff and Russia doing loads of, you know, and they're trying to, you know, come up with their hash war sort of thesis stuff, which I love. I think Jason, you know, Jason Lowry's a total genius. I love everything he says about proof of work and et cetera, et cetera. But it strikes me that wouldn't it be better? Wouldn't it wouldn't it work if instead of relying on someone to secure the chain, instead of saying, look, you know, there's this. There's this sort of duality in blockchain systems where you have the people that run the chain and the people that use the chain. And to me, that always seems to lead to one thing, which is less and less people who run it because they compete with each other and the weaker players get pushed aside. And so what you find is that at the bottom layer of all of these chains is a competitive game. Yeah, the miners compete against each other. If one wins a block, the other doesn't win a block. This is a win-lose scenario, as they call it. This is a competitive game. We're incredible competitors. We're top predator. Humans are incredible at this, yeah? And so when you're talking about Bitcoin mining or Ethereum stakers or whatever it is, validators, blah, 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 I know how this is going to end. And what Minima tries to do, which is the you know the blockchain that I work on, is we have replaced that competitive game at the base layer with a cooperative game. And what Minima does is it says, look, you don't need someone to look after you. You don't need someone to hold your hand. You don't need to outsource your security to somebody. You can do it yourself. And so on Minima, what we've done is we've come up with a system that is so small and compact that every single user can run it in full. And when I say in full, I don't just mean fully validating. I mean, you need to be intricately involved in the construction of the chain. That's the bit that matters. Building the blocks, 
putting the transactions into the blocks. That's where the attack takes place. Yeah, that's where the censorship takes place. I mean, blockchains are incredibly slow, clunky databases. They're frankly useless at everything, but they do this one thing that nothing else can do, which is why they're so amazing. What is this thing that they do? What is this ability that they give us that we can't get from anything else? Censorship resistance. That's the thing. That's what a blockchain is for. And actually, when I, you know, when I think about the Bitcoiners, I mean, not to disparage them or anything, but it strikes me that they're conflating hard fork attacks and soft fork attacks. And just to get a little bit technical here, what I mean by that is that, you know, they, they sort of think, look, there's lots of nodes out there validating the network, this economic majority argument that they keep using. And they keep saying, so you're not going to, you know, that that is actually what keeps the network running. The miners just are the engines that are doing it. And I would say to that, that that is incorrect, because actually what your fully validating node does is it prevents a hard fork. Excellent. Yeah, you absolutely have to have that. And what I mean when I say a hard fork is this is the set of valid transactions. I'm now going to add a new one. I'm going to expand the set of valid transactions. So if I came up with a transaction that was like, I'm going to give Ricardo 100 Bitcoins that he doesn't own. That's an invalid transaction in the old system. But if we do a hard fork, we could come up with a, you know, with a transaction that worked with this special signature, blah, blah, blah. Ricardo can print money. That can't happen when you're all validating. Fantastic. That's a hard fork attack. Lots of validators prevents that. But as I just said earlier, there's only one thing that a blockchain is good at that does, and that is censorship resistance. And a censorship attack is not a hard fork attack. A censorship attack is a soft fork attack. What do we mean when we say soft fork attack? We mean here is a set of valid transactions and now I'm going to make that set smaller. So in other words, there's a transaction that somebody in Russia sends and they don't want to put it into a block. They don't have to put it into a block. That's called censorship. That's really bad. And there's nothing that your validating node can do to, prov to force a miner to add that transaction to a block. If he doesn't want to add it to the block, there's nothing you can do about it. It doesn't break the rules. He hasn't tried to change the game. Your, your node still thinks that is a valid block. It just doesn't have the transaction that they don't want to add you know, to the block. And so the only people that are involved in doing the one thing that blockchains are good at doing are the ones who build the blocks. Frankly, checking all the transactions and making sure you don't do a hard fork attack is a given. Of course you want to do that. That's fantastic. No one's breaking the rules. But what really matters is that everybody should be involved in building the chain. And that's what Minima tries to do. How does Minima do this? Like, how how is it different? Like, how, how are transactions being validated in Minima if it's okay. not using proof of work or, or like ASIC miners? Or does Minima use proof of work? Or is it like... Of course, state. Minima uses yeah. proof of work, work because proof of work is okay. total genius. Yeah, I love proof of work. But what Minima does is it doesn't pay people to do the work. What Minima does is it lets the users mine their own transactions. And then by using some clever masks, we stick all of that proof of work together. And that is what actually secures the chain. And so when, so when you're coming up with this system, you're thinking, okay, I want to do a different system. I want a system where everybody does everything. So what have, what have, what do we got to think about here? And so the first thing you have to do is think, like, well, where's it going to run? How am I going to run this? And you're like, well, I can't run it on a, you know, on a laptop because half the planet doesn't have laptops. And I certainly can't run it on servers or Kubernetes clusters or any of that stuff because even less of the planet has that. And so when you're thinking about that, you come to the you know, pretty obvious conclusion that the only device that you can reasonably expect your users to have is a mobile phone. So the first thing you say to yourself is, all right, I've got to write an entire blockchain system that runs on your mobile phone. You go, okay, right? And then you say to yourself, okay, well, how am I going to fit these massive databases? Yeah, blockchains have huge databases. There's lots of stuff going on. How is that going to possibly fit onto your phone? Well, if you have the benefit of hindsight and if you can look back at you know the last decade of blockchain battles you will see there have been some beautiful inventions and stuff that has gone on which simply can't be hard forked into the current chains because that's you know very complicated and one of those things is called a proof database i mean peter todd you know a great man uh was the one that first sort of introduced that to me on, on bitcoin talk way back when with an mmr database and Effectively, what that says is, and the way that we do it with Minima, is that the old paradigm is that everybody has a big book. 
everybody has this big book and all the transactions are in the book. And when you send a transaction, I can look in my book, I get the transaction, I go, does Ricardo have this money? Okay, I find you on page 457. Yes, this is a valid transaction. Well, why don't we flip that? And why don't we say, well, look, there's no point me looking after Ricardo's, you know, I don't need to know whether Ricardo's got the money, but I need him to be able to prove it to me when he sends a transaction. And so in a proof database, what happens is that instead of everybody storing everything, I store the data that is relevant to me and you store the data that is relevant to you. And then when you send a transaction, you add a mathematical proof that we can all validate. And that shows me that you, your coins are valid. And what this effectively means is that all of us keep the spine, but I don't keep all the pages. And you keep the page with your coins on them, and I keep the page with my coins on them. And when I send a transaction, I add that data to the transaction, and everybody checks that the page fits the spine because it's got a sort of jaggedy edge, and it goes, oh, look, this is valid. You know, it's, it's a Merkle tree. Yeah, it's Merkle path, it's a Merkle root, not to get too complicated. Um, and so you can actually have a system where I now have all the data that is relevant to me. And I check everybody's data when they send it, but I don't keep it because when you send a transaction, you add that data to your transaction and so I can check it. And so now my database is only the size of my coins and your database is only the size of your coins. But what's really nice about this system is that it's lossless, which means we have as much data as you would normally have in one of these big databases, but everybody only keeps the bit that matters to them. And so you're like, wow, okay, cool. So now we have a system where we can actually have terra, terra quads of data, you know, whatever the hell you want, but everybody only stores a little bit of data and that'll fit on your phone. You're like, oh, okay, that's nice. And then I guess the, the last component that you sort of really need to crack is what's the consensus engine gonna be? Is it gonna be proof of work? Is it gonna be proof of stake, et cetera, et cetera. And again, Minima has gone for proof of work. This is very important. Proof of work is a commodity. Proof of work is a thing that people don't seem to understand. Proof of work is actually something objective. This is really important. You know, money should be objective. What I mean by that is that when I give you a proof, when I give you proof of work, I've proved the work that I have done to make it. And you don't have to ask anybody. You can look at that piece of data that I've given you and independently yourself objectively go, yep. He's done the work. I can see the zeros. He's done a lot of hashing. You couldn't have done this without actually having done the work. It's a thing. Proof of stake is not that. Proof of stake is an equity. Yeah, it's in the title. It's a stake. It's an equity thing. And what that means is that it's subjective. Yeah, it means that I can only prove the proof of stake by asking somebody else. Proof of stake is only valid in its own system. It's not something, if I, like you can look at Ethereum as a proof of stake chain. In my bedroom, I could fake an Ethereum chain. I could come up with a completely new Ethereum chain, just myself, just mucking about, giving myself money, whatever. If I showed you both those chains, you would not be able to tell which one was the real Ethereum and which one was my fake chain. And the way that you would tell which one it is, is by going to a website or going to an exchange and they would say, well, look, we're using this one. You know, you'd have to you have to ask somebody. This is subjective. There is some, an external thing that you need to speak to to tell you. It is not an objective thing. It's not like a lump of gold. And if you want to do, if you want to have a shot at the title, and if you want to be the world's future monetary system, you know, we've had commodity money for a thousand years, ten thousand years. We understand it. We understand peanuts. We understand silver. We understand gold. Fiat money, equity money, we've had for sixty years, and look what a complete disaster it is. Yeah, this sort of subjective notion of money, that's not gonna work. So it had to be proof of work, yeah? I mean, there are uses, that, don't get me wrong, there are uses for proof of stake, money isn't one of them. Yeah, proof of stake can be useful. You know, if I was 10 banks and we wanted to interact with each other, there's no way I'd use proof of work, total waste of energy, why would I do that? I'd just use proof of stake, yeah? But if I wanna have money, if I wanna have a permissionless system, if I wanna have a system where anybody can play without having to ask anybody else anything, then it's gotta be proof of work. And so you think, okay, proof of work, but how do I stop what I mentioned earlier, which is this emergent centralization? How do I make a system that actually remains decentralized, which doesn't centralize over time? This seems to me to be the current issue, the current crux. And what you do is you say, well, look, I'm not gonna pay you to do the work. You're gonna do the work, you're gonna do a little bit of work, 
And when you do this work, this is going to allow you access to the network. And so the sort of paradigm shift is instead of saying, I've got 10 really big miners and they do loads and loads of work, I'm going to say, well, look, I've got a billion users and they all do a tiny bit of work. But a billion times a small number is equal to 10 times a big number. So in terms of overall hash rate, you can actually achieve these numbers as long as you have enough users. And so Minima uses a cooperative game. A cooperative games are good because they're win-win. What I mean by that is that when you mine your transaction and you forward it to me, and then I see that you've done the work, and I'm like, oh, okay, he's done the work, and I forward it, you've actually secured my coins as well. Now, you do it to secure your coins. You're trying to protect your coins. You're not doing it to protect my coins. That's fine. There's no altruism. That always breaks. Yeah, you need to have the correct incentives. But you do some work to protect your coins. And I'm like, oh, look, he's done some work, which protects my coins as well. So I'll forward that. And when I do some work, I'm trying to protect my coins. Like I do, you know, 10 seconds every 10 minutes. Yeah. You actually mine your own transactions. We have a pulse network that goes on. But effectively, what we want is 1% of your phone. Yes, yeah, so you're not there grinding away. And there's no reason for you to grind away because you don't get paid. Yeah. The really big difference is that we've removed the Coinbase transaction from a technical point of view. In every block, there is a Coinbase transaction which pays the person who found the block. Minima doesn't have that. Minima simply has users forwarding these messages to each other because all of those messages add up, and that is what secures the network. So we've got a system which runs on your phone. We've got a system that doesn't use a massive amount of data because your database is now a proof DB. And we've got a consensus engine backed by a commodity, an electric commodity, proof of work, which doesn't centralize over time. Like one of the really nice things is that what I have noticed is that when blockchains get bigger, the larger they get, the more centralized they get it, it, on all of them. I'm seeing this with every single one, especially Ethereum, you know, and Bitcoin, beautiful Bitcoin. Um, you know, that it seems to me pretty apparent the way that the mining is going with these massive racks and things. You know, those, those huge server farms are not processing transactions. Yeah, that's not what you need all those computers for. Those computers are hashing. Yeah, they're fighting other miners. You know, wonderful, you know, go for it. But how are you going to compete with that? How is how me and you, Ricardo, are going to compete with Riot? Yeah, with Riot blockchain mining. It's just not going to happen. So this way, all the users participate in the game cooperatively to secure the network with proof of work. Um, I mean, other than that, we use a UTXO system. We have, you know, a nice scripting language that basically adds the five or six functions that I think Bitcoin really, you know, could do with you know, covenants, Merkle paths, you know, check signatures, you know, a few. I mean, frankly, other than this, you know, I was happy with Bitcoin, but, you know, the SegWit wars sort of turned, you know, that's when we first had our first lovers tiff, if I'm honest. And, um, you know, that's when I realized that I'd become a bit player. You know, I used to be a runner. I used to run it on my, on, my, on my desktop. I had dash gen as one of the parameters. I used to be mining with all the others. And then there came a moment where I realized that I no longer mattered in that sense. And I found that quite difficult. I suddenly realized that my opinion on what should be happening to the network, should we have big blocks, shouldn't we have big blocks, didn't matter what I thought. Yeah, I was going to go with what the miners thought and i was like when did this happen how come i've been kicked off the network as a as a decider as a, as a you know i'm a user now i'm not a runner and that's what i didn't want to happen with minima so every single user of minima runs the same software in the same way and is incentivized to do the same work i mean if you don't do the work we kick you off the network so you've got to do the work and your transactions aren't accepted so there are you know you actually have to do the work to have your messages sent but it's such a small amount of work that it doesn't matter that you don't care um, and, and that's, you know, that's really where, where Minima does its thing. You have a lot of really interesting takes about, uh, some of these issues that, that surround other chains. Um, so if Minima doesn't have like a Coinbase transaction, how are new tokens distributed to, to the users amongst the network? Like, yeah, no. Is there like a block reward or like how, how, no, how does that so you work? have to print them just like proof. Of, so we had to print them at the beginning. There's no mechanism for distributing the coins. Not that I think a decentralized mechanism is required for a decentralized chain. So what I mean by that is if Satoshi had just printed 21 million Bitcoins and he'd just given them out to people and done stuff with them, I don't think that would have affected the overall decentralization at the end of the game. Yeah, this fact that you, you can do it via the mining. But in minimum, we had to create, we've got, and also, you know, we're hard capped, which is nice. Um, and so we just printed all the coins, then we ran an incentive program, we gave out, we're giving it out to the users who, who run it at the moment, and at some point we're going to run out, 
and then it's like woo yeah all the coins are given out you know trying to give these coins out um i i mean it's interesting because not having to pay the miners does something very very interesting because if i look at you know the issues that people have with bitcoin for instance you know the real the real issue between the bitcoiners and the ethereums is the thing about fees yeah and it's like well the the mining subsidy isn't going to be enough to pay for the security when you pay someone to secure your network the amount you pay them matters because what you pay them is what it would cost someone to attack yeah so the bitcoiners have got a fixed cap which is essential yeah if you want to have the world's monetary of the, if you want to have the world's monetary system of the future whatever it is i want it to be hard capped i want to know that my amount of that money isn't going to be diluted so that you know that's clearly the best option 21 million is the strongest meme in crypto that's what everybody understands they all get it they love it but you have a problem if you have to pay miners because you can't print new coins and so what the ethereum says they say well look that's never going to work you know you, the amount of fees that are paid on layer one are not going to be enough to sustain the security of the global monetary system and only if those fees are ridiculous will the system actually be secure and you're like mm, yeah. so how are we going to get around that and actually the way to get around that is to not have to pay fees to not so bitcoin security is based on the amount of fees that are paid it is proportional to the amount of fees that are paid minimum security is not based on that minimum has a burn so when you send a transaction you can burn a tiny amount but that is only to help you order the transactions in the mempool yeah so i as a user would will add your transaction before someone else as if you burn more it's interesting because a burn is basically a fee that you pay to the entire network you know it's a fractional amount but if you're burning some of your coins then obviously everybody else's coins go up a fractional amount in terms of the total you know the percentage of the total that they are becomes slightly more so if you're going to burn more i'll add your transaction before somebody else's to you know to whatever block i'm, I'm trying to build so if you get rid of this idea that i have to pay somebody you suddenly get rid of this problem that bitcoin has which is well how are you going to sustain the network minimum security is purely a function of the number of users on the network it is not a function of the fees paid and even more interesting since layer one doesn't scale doesn't scale for any of the chains not for bitcoin not for ethereum although they don't seem to realize this you know that's just not where the action takes place that is the settlement layer it is not scalable because everybody has to process it. This is the beauty of decentralization. And so you're never going to get a million transactions per second on layer one. And frankly, we need a million transactions per second if we want to seriously think about having the whole world on it so that everybody can use it whenever they want. Layer two is where the action takes place. Layer two is where you can have that sort of throughput. And I might add that, you know, uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum's layer two strategy are very different. Bitcoin has lightning. Lightning is total genius. I absolutely love it. It's a really great system. What's great about it is that it doesn't use a blockchain. What's great about it is that that system scales. And when I say scales, I, you know, that's a Boolean, that's true or false. It's zero one. What I mean by that is that there is no limit to the number of transactions that you can process on lightning. The only limit is frankly, the speed of your computer. Yeah. Me and you transact P to P on lightning which is signing transactions and swapping them with each other as fast as we can and then when we want to somehow settle then you have to post the latest one but we could have done a million transactions over layer two without ever touching layer one nothing has to go on layer one and then eventually we post it that's a great system that works whereas what ethereum has done is said look we've got a totally non-scalable blockchain system on layer one let's just add another blockchain and call it polygon or let's just add another chain and try to scale which doesn't strike me as a system that is going to stale to millions of transactions per second but when you're doing that what that means is that all the economic activity goes on to layer two none of those fees go to the miners you know 99.999 percent of the traffic has to be off chain 99.999 percent of the traffic is not going to pay the miners on layer one so you're going to have to extract the fees because security is inherited from the lower level. So whatever layer two is, it's only as secure as whatever layer one is. Yeah, whatever's happening on layer two, doesn't matter how secure you think that is. If your layer one is not secure, your layer two is not secure or your layer three. And so what we now have a system is you're going to have to pay for the entire security of layer one with 0.001% of the traffic. How's that going to work?
yeah that's it means you're gonna have to have ridiculous fees yeah to be able to compensate for the fact that most of the transactions are going off chain again this is not an issue for minimum because we're not paying people on layer one to secure the chain because we do look after you know we look after ourselves you know i'm a child i'm fully sovereign on minimum i don't rely on anybody else and that's a really big deal the fact that we don't have to worry about fees mean and we don't have to worry about you know me mechanics of chain uh, transactions going off chain uh, means that we can have a hard cap and see what i mean is that the ethereums they know this and they're like no 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 no, no. you have to have an expanding supply you have to have an inflationary system because that's the only way that we can be sure to pay the miners and i and i sort of accept that argument it's like at least they know on Ethereum that they're always going to have enough ETH to pay their miners. But then you've lost the hard cap and everyone loves the hard cap. So it's like, how do I have the best of both these systems? I want a system that doesn't break, that doesn't become insecure, but does have a hard cap. And I believe Minima is the only one that has fixed that issue, actually. Out of curiosity, are, are you aware of how Monero's attempted to solve this problem with the tail emission that's kind of like... Um... Yeah, they broke the hard cap. That's fine. If you break the hard cap, yeah. you can do it. I agree. And, you know, they might say, well, there's always a loss, you know, so people lose their coins. And so it's somehow this, but it's like, it's not 21 million. Yeah. yeah. It's not the number. It's not, it's not hard, hard cap. It's like, this is the, money. that's, that's the perfect solution. So yeah, you can say, look, we're actually going to have doggy. Yeah. We're going to have 10,000. I'd rather a percentage, frankly, than you know, 10,000, like doggy gives you 10,000 doggy every block forever. So that'll become insignificant. I mean, there's, once there's 50 trillion doggy, what's 10,000 doggy going to do? Nothing. So frankly, that system's broken as well. But if you said, look, we'll print 1%. I mean, for instance, how does Ethereum come up with the number that it prints? You know, what, it prints 7% at the moment? 7% is massive. That means you double the number of coins in the entire system in about 10 to 12 years or something. Yeah. That means your amount of money halves every 12 years. It's like, well, that doesn't sound like a store of value to me. Yeah, I just want to know if I've got, you know what I mean? What, what kind of a store of value is that? I just want to know that I've got 1%. I've got 0.001% of the whole system, and I will have that in 100 years' time. You know, it's interesting because okay. once you have, sorry, when you have the hard cap, your yield, your increase in value is actually programmed in. You're actually going to benefit from the growth of the whole world. As the growth of the world increases, as the market cap, you know, as, as, as the sort of value of, your coin increases as the world increases, then your percentage of it will increase in value as well. You sort of, everybody benefits when the global economy grows and you don't actually have to do anything. Yeah, it's a really good store of value, but you've got to have a hard cap. I appreciate your insight on that. Um, you started to talk about some of the layers that make up Minima and uh, from browsing the Minima website, kind of reading through the white paper, uh, I noticed that Minima has an architecture of like four layers. Can you explain what those layers are and what sure. role each of them has within the ecosystem? Yeah. So everybody's got a layer one. That's the bottom layer. That's the layer that everybody has to process. That's the one where every single person has to check every single thing that happens on that layer. That's why it doesn't scale. Yeah, that's basically a function of, I mean, on other chains, they their their chains are sort of defined by the most powerful computer that runs it. It's like, oh, look how powerful my computer is that runs this, or look how powerful Polkadot is with its Kubernetes cluster. Whereas on minimum, we flip that, and we sort of define the network by the least powerful phone that runs it. I've got a hundred quid Qbot here that's running minimum fine. Um, and so layer one is the one that everybody processes, and that's great. And then on minimum, what we do is we've actually got another layer. So we have a large P2P network now. Yeah, we have an enormous number of users on the network with their nodes and everything. And so what we've done is we've actually come up with this information layer. So layer one is the value layer. This is where we transact with the minima and the tokens and all of that stuff. And then actually we've got an information layer built on top of that. And what's interesting about an information layer is that I can send information, not value. Now, value needs to be processed by everybody because your value affects my value. But information can be transmitted peer to peer. Yeah, me and you can have a chat and it doesn't affect him. And what's really nice is that on the minimum network, we, we, we make that possible by having the correct incentives. So when I want to send an information message, I mine that message. I actually put proof of work into that message. And that is what incentivizes the network to forward it to the correct recipient. But only the people who are you know, required to send the message see that message. But I have to do work to do it, which is why I'm happy to forward the message for you. 
So what we've got is a network where the more messages you send over Maxima, the more secure the network. Yeah, which is a really nice incentive, which sort of works. Yeah, because we've tried to do this before. We've tried to come up with peer-to-peer -peer, peer -peer networks in the past, and they're always sort of altruistic. I mean, I've got to say, I think Nostra's a bit like that. Yeah, I love it, but mm, it's not going to work. It doesn't work because it always relies on nerds setting up servers to forward stuff for the non-nerds, and they're not actually getting anything for it other than the network. Yeah, and that always breaks because there's always way more non-nerds than nerds. What you want is a system where I'm happy for you to send as many messages as you want, because the more messages you send, the more secure the network is. The more secure the network is, you know, the more value I can store securely. The more value I can store securely, then the more valuable the network, the more valuable my coins. So I'm actually happy to forward those messages for you. So we have the layer, the, the value layer on layer one. We have information on layer two. And the reason that's important is because on top of that, we have what we call Omnia which is our lightning network. You know, lightning is a protocol. It's not specific to Bitcoin. It actually operates with any other UTA. You know, there are other lightning networks that, you know, lightning, uh, Litecoin, I think has a, you know, they're much smaller because nobody uses it, but we have the lightning network and that actually requires information of contracts to be shared. So that's why it's important to have the information layer and the value layer. Yeah, we have an incentive compatible information layer built on top of layer zero. And so on top of that, we have our Lightning Network, which is the same as the Lightning Network, although I would say that we use L2. So currently, Lightning uses the first iteration of Lightning, and it's wonderful and all of those things. But there is you know, there is chatter in the background about well, we could make it really cool if we did that's the other. Obviously, benefit of hindsight, we have added all of those features. So we have the next version of Lightning, uh, which is really nice, yeah, which, is, you know, which is really sorts things out. So we have that on top. And that's really where all the action has to take place. That's the that's the the actual layer two where you could do infinite transactions where me and you can transact quickly and you know censorship resistant, free. You know they're cheap, instant. They're free. It's like what's not to like? Why wouldn't you use that? You know, like the Lightning Network. You know, it is a, it's an absolute marvel of technology. Just do you brilliant. still have to like fund bi-directional uh, payment channels? Like you do. Like, you yeah, to, yeah, like, absolutely. But you yeah. can do more things with L2. So you can actually do more complicated contracts because we have covenant covenants and stuff like that. So there are some some quite interesting scenarios that can play out in that system. You know, state chains and all of that stuff. You know, there's quite a lot of stuff just bubbling on the edges. As soon as they add a few functions to Bitcoins, you'll be able to get that. So we do all of that. And so that's our you know, Omnia layer. And then sitting on top of all of this, we have this thing called the Minidap system. And that's quite an interesting system because you know, um, there have been some wonderful inventions in crypto. And um, one of the most successful, I'd have to say, is MetaMask. You know, Ethereum centralization aside, MetaMask is a nice piece of tech. What I mean by that is that everybody uses it. And so what they did, what, what the Ethereum boys did is they said, look, why don't we give access to this blockchain tech to 100 million web developers? Yeah, why don't we come up with a system that allows normal web people to write websites that interface with our blockchain? And they were like, mm, you know, the Bitcoiners didn't do this. They were like, no, we're not going to have that system. The Ethereum's went, no, 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 no. And MetaMask has been a raging success. What I mean by that is that look at the applications that we have. Look at what has come out of this permissionless system. We basically come up with a system which is equal to the current financial system in a decade. There you go. So the whole concept of MetaMask is really, really nice. The problem with MetaMask is it's totally centralized. The problem with MetaMask is that when I access MetaMask, I'm actually accessing Infura servers. Yeah, 99.99% of people who access MetaMask are just using consensus and, and their servers. If they were shut down tomorrow, what would happen? Nobody would be able to use anything because nobody's running an Ethereum node, I can assure you. So everybody would be in trouble. So what we did for Minima was that we actually embed a web server, got a web server running on my little phone. And you can write these applications just like a normal application, like a website application, and then you zip it. And then you send it to someone and then they can open it and it accesses your Minima node. And so you're basically running a local version of MetaMask. And instead of having to go to a website, so when someone says to me, have you seen this great decentralized application? I'm like, oh, wicked, give it to me. And like, now you have to go to www.uniswap.com. And I'm like, why well, do I have to go to a website? What if the website gets taken down? What if, they, what if they decide to change the code and I don't like it? That doesn't sound decentralized to me. It sounds like somebody else is in charge. 
Whereas on minimum, what happens is that you actually zip these websites up. You know, there's a JS file like www.js, you know, like exactly the same way that you would use Ethereum, but you're accessing your own node. And so we call this mini dApps. And this is our application ecosystem. And that sits on top of everything. And what this means so, is that when, sorry, when, so when I write a mini DAP and I give it to you, Ricardo, I can never take it away from you. I can never change it. I can give you an upgraded version and ask you to use it. And if you say, oh, this is much better, I'm going to use it. But if you don't like it, you can use the old version because you still have a copy of that. And that's that sits at the top of our stack of, you know, stuff. Okay. And the mini DAPs are like things like, I don't know, like a marketplace, a like an NFT marketplace yeah. or, or a DEX or, or like some of these other decentralized. Yeah. Like we also, yeah. All of that. Or for instance, we've got an application currently, which was it started as a proof of concept, but we haven't actually written the final version. It's called Max Solo. And it's basically trying to be WhatsApp. So imagine a version of WhatsApp that looks exactly like WhatsApp. You use WhatsApp web. Yeah. You can use it on your phone. You use WhatsApp web. Nice application yeah, daily. Yeah, everybody does. It's a beautiful application. Totally, they're reading everything. Yeah, they have the private keys. They're reading everything. They're scanning all your messages. That is not a private chat. And so we've got a mini DAP that looks like that, that does that, that operates on our layer two, you know, on our maxima. We call minima the layer zero, the value layer. We call maxima the information layer. And we have Omnia, and then we have the mini DAPs on top. And so one of our mini DAPs is just a chat application. We have another one called Chatter, which is our version of Twitter, which is really nice. I really like Chatter. Um, no center, no server. I don't know what people are saying. I can't censor it. I can't turn it off. This excites me. This is what I want. I don't want to be able to turn it off. I, everything I work on, I think, is there any way that I can stop people from doing this? And if there is, I need to fix it so I can't. Um, so yeah, you can write, you know, so one of the main application people use is the wallet you know, and token creation and, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, but we have, um, you know, we have a yield product where you can send stuff and we send you this, or we have uh, future cash, which is the system for sending money to the future. Yeah? So you can sort of have installment payments coming in later, just, you know, basic financial stuff. Uh, and yeah, that's what you can write as a mini DAP. Within crypto, there seems to be like a bifurcation where there's like the Bitcoin ecosystem and then there's like the multi-chain Web3 kind of, other side of the, the crypto world. Um, Minima seems like it has kind of qualities from both sides of, of the crypto divide. Uh, how, like, where do you envision Minima within the wider crypto, like Web3 multi-chain ecosystem? When I think, of, I mean, I'd like Minima to be, I mean, I want Minima to be, there's, money is winner take all. There will only be one winner here. Yeah, there's only one winner of the game of coins as in one, which is the money. And then there'll be all the other little stuff that happens around the edge. That's fine. Minim is trying to be the commodity. Minim is trying to be Bitcoin. Yeah, that's really, he's the, he's the king. Yeah, you, you, well, that's who you're going after. And then you can build stuff off, you know, off the side of it. But what I'd say about this Web3 stuff is, for instance, can you imagine if Consensus just came up with Ethereum.com? I mean, Binance tried to do this, and I was actually really pro what they tried to do there. Yeah, but they, what they did is they then tried to do decentralization theater. What they did is they tried to say, yeah, 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 we are decentralized when we all know they're not, when we all know that all the runners are permissioned. And it's like, look, I don't want that. What I want is an EVM, yeah, one EVM running as fast as you can run it. Yeah, because everything would work. They could do Ethereum.com and say, look, we've got a badass computer running Ethereum.com, Ethereum. We don't have to do any of the, the nightmare of decentralization of consensus across different machines. Yeah, it's like a total, ugh. Whereas if you could get rid of that and just give me full speed, full. So when I send you a transaction, I don't want it to go in a block. I just want you to process it through the EVM. And what you get with that is that all the applications would work. Uniswap would work. You know, all the different things we see out there would work. Are because you don't need a censorship resistant blockchain to sell a monkey JPEG for USDT. Yeah, Cent censorship resistance costs. You know, it's expensive. It's like, do you really need to be using a censorship resistant network for that? What I, what you basically come up with is like a cool financial PHP server. No offense. That's what Ethereum is when I see it. I'm like, all right, so they've got a PHP server that's sort of financial, financially minded. But if they did Ethereum.com, imagine what they could do. They're like, we're hard forking tonight, so the, the network will be down for half an hour, and then we'll be running again. And this is the new function you get. Wow, amazing, yeah? We're upgrading the computers tomorrow, so we're actually going to increase the number of transactions you can do from 1,000 a second to 2,000 a second. We don't have to ask permission. We can just do it, and it's like, wow, cool. 
Now, can I run the Silk Road on yours? No. That's 1% of the market. Can I, you know, can I sell my monkey JPEG for USDT? Yeah, sure. Can I do my Arve stuff? Can I do my compound? Can I do that? Most of it, yes, you can. So frankly, I see a lot of wasted, you know, we don't need this stuff. We don't, you know, this is this is the thing that I'm confused about. A database is a million times faster. And half the stuff I see, I'm like, why don't they just use a SQL database? Why are you using a blockchain? Yeah, you're only using a blockchain because of its censorship resistance. And that's expensive. It's slow. It's clunky. Yeah. And if you don't need it, don't use it. And so part of me thinks that there is going to be a washout soon. And actually that this sort of stuff is going to become less blockchain based because there's just no need to use a blockchain. You, you, you know, the right tool for the right job. Now, money. Sure. That has to be blockchain based money. You know, China, Russia, America transacting with different countries that cannot be in the power of anybody else. I mean, but just to say. Ethereum. Yeah. Um, one blog post, one blog post, 70% of the network was censored. They said, look, you're not allowed to use Tornado Cash. Boom, 70% of the network was, was censored. That is a fail in my, in my eyes. Yeah, that is like, that's, that, you know, that, oh, it doesn't matter. You can still do all this other stuff. It's like, I don't care about the other stuff. That's the bit that matters. You're meant to be censorship resistant. You're meant to be able to withstand exactly this attack. And one, they didn't even try to attack you. That wasn't even an attack. It was a blog post and it completely ruined any idea that you are censorship, you know, resistant, you know, because proof of stake centralizes, you know, ridiculously, you know, this is exactly what we told them for five years, but they didn't listen. That's fine. I mean, I'm upset about it. You know, I don't, you know, I liked Ethereum. I don't anymore. You know, why, when they gave up proof of work, they handed the keys to Bitcoin. They said, look, we're not going to be the commodity. We're not going to be the money of the future. You know, Ethereum would work so much better if it was cheap. Why? It's not a store of value. Yeah, it's a uh, it's Bitcoiners conflate soft fork attacks and hard fork attacks. Ethereum's conflate being useful and being valuable. These are two very different qualities. You're not valuable just because you're useful. Yeah, I had a laptop, a Macintosh 10 years ago, used it all the time. Absolutely loved it. Very, very useful device. I no longer use it. It's not useful anymore. It's not valuable anymore. I couldn't sell it on eBay if I wanted to. Yeah, I bought some gold 10 years ago, never even looked at it, certainly never used it. It's more valuable today than it was then. There is a difference between being useful and being valuable. These are very different qualities derived from very different properties. And this is something that I don't think has been understood. You know, Bitcoin currently is valuable, you know, and people sort of think it's not as useful as Ethereum. And it's like, well, it's not meant to be, it's meant to be valuable. Yeah, you can be valuable as well. You can be useful as well as valuable. But it's got to be valuable. If it's going to be my money, it's going to be my store of value. And it's like, well, Ethereum is really useful. And it's like, yeah, it's useful, but it's not valuable. Yeah, it doesn't cost any, like you've made it now. So the network doesn't cost anything to run. That's what proof of stake does. It's like giving yourself a leg up. It's like Ethereum is valuable. Therefore, it's expensive to secure. Therefore, it's secure. And therefore, it's valuable. It's like, wait a second. This is, this is called a circular logical fallacy. I started with it's valuable and I ended with it's valuable. Whereas proof of work is like, it's expensive, you know, to generate all that work. Therefore, it's expensive to attack. Therefore, it's secure. Therefore, it's valuable. Nice, logical, linear argument. And this is also, I mean, I think these are quite subtle points, but they're so obvious to some of us. It's like, this is not valuable. Somebody, are you telling me China is going to use Ethereum? No way. And they could come up with another version. Like the, the only thing that actually makes these chains valuable is the distribution of the hash. Yeah. Hash rate does not equal security distribution of hash rate is what matters stake does not equal security distribution of stake is what matters so if china wanted to come up with a chain that was more secure than ethereum all they'd have to do is get twenty thousand people to run ethereum ethereum underscore china version and it would be bigger better more secure because there'd be more validators yeah and it wouldn't cost anything because they've now made it that it doesn't cost anything because that's what proof of stake does so you're like Ooh. You know, so there's a lot of misconceptions in my honest opinion. I mean, I, yeah, I don't know. You know, this is I've had this discussion with many people and most people don't get it at all. Uh, but it seems pretty obvious to me. I like the fact that you understand the importance of censorship resistance. Um, That's the only thing like that Bitcoin matters. Goes. Yeah. And we've seen that with Bitcoin's like transparent 
ledger that anybody can verify with a node or go onto a block explorer and verify. Um, that's also kind of like opened up an attack vector for on-chain surveillance, like Chainalysis and Cyphertrace and these other startups that have been um, helping law enforcement kind of figure out what's going on on the dark web and stuff like that. And Bitcoin's original value proposition was that it was like a censorship resistant means to do transactions that perhaps like a, a state level um, adversary doesn't want state you to State level do. attack is the only one to worry about. Okay, so how does Minima like stack up, I guess, in regards to like privacy, like could someone potentially use Minima without like this attack vector of like blockchain surveillance, um, you know, kind of like- Well, interestingly, just the to say that um, as Satoshi said, you know, you can use a new account, you know, we are into, this is my address. Yeah, so this is my coin address. So this is my Ethereum address. So I send everything to that. That's very bad. And the problem with that is that you are ruining my anonymity set. So even if I always use a new one, the fact that you don't affects me because they know that that's you, which means that those, those transactions cannot be me. And so the set of transactions that they look for me is smaller. But if you wanted to, you could say, look, everyone's got to use a new address every time you do a transaction. That would already make it much, much harder. You know, just a simple thing without having to do hard forks or soft forks or any cool ring signatures or any of that stuff. There are things you can do to make yourself more private. If it became an issue, if it became a problem, it's all about UX, really, isn't it? It's all about trying to get this stuff into the hands of you know, my wife, my mother. You know, how are they possibly going to understand this? And that's the current problem that I feel crypto also has, which is just trying to become usable enough. You know, remember your private keys. It's like, ah, they're never going to do that. Yeah, I'd rather just go to Coinbase. And I'd like my mom, go to Coinbase. Yeah, it's just impossible. Yeah, it's with the tech, the tools, we just haven't got the biometric private key converter so that she doesn't have to remember 24 words. But it is possible to be more private. It is possible for it to be more secure without doing anything funky or special. Um, and that, if you ask me, is more a question of the software that is being written on top. So we are UTX model, like Bitcoin. There are things that could be done to make this far more private. Yeah, you don't have to be using this. You shouldn't be able to tell who it is, even you know, even with chain analysis. You know. Ah, cool. Um, it is possible for us to do stuff, which uh, makes it much, much harder for people to trace that stuff. I mean, on minimum, we have a, an advantage where not everybody has a copy of everything. And so when you actually join the network, the only thing you download is a record of the history of the PAL. Yeah, so everybody keeps a record of the PAL, the work. So you know which is the heaviest chain objectively. So you can tell this is the right chain. This is not the right chain because it's weaker. It doesn't have as much work in it. But I don't have a copy of the transactions that occurred three weeks ago. Like, I literally don't have a transaction. I don't have, we don't keep that stuff. I only keep the stuff that's relevant to me. He only keeps the stuff that's relevant to you. When you join the network, you will, you will keep the stuff that is relevant to you. But if somebody wanted to, somebody trawl through and say, I want to see all the transactions that have happened on minimum since you launched, good luck. Yeah, because we don't have that. We don't keep, we don't need to keep it. We just keep the POW. Yeah, and the, and the, and the spine of the book. That's, that's what we keep. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, although I would say, you know, it's interesting of them just, just to say that Bitcoin has, you know, so confidential transactions, you know, confidential transactions, what they use on liquid. That's really nice. It's really clever because there's no detritus. There's no extra stuff. When you're looking at Zcash, when you're looking at Monero, when you're looking at these very complicated privacy schemes, they have a lot of data that needs to be stored. They have a lot of extra stuff that you need to keep. Whereas confidential transactions, which basically are about the fact that there is a hash function out there, you know, hashing. And I can say, look, one plus two is three. This special hash plus this special hash, if I hash one and I hash two, the hash is equal to the hash of three. That number is equal to the hash of three. That's a really weird property, yeah? Uh, and what they do is they add little fractional amounts, so you always use different numbers. So when you use the number one, it's always different from when you use one a second time, blah, blah, blah. But anyway, that's the, if you ask me, that's the cleanest, bestest, the way Liquid does it. No detritus, nothing. It's just in the transaction, small amount of data. Um, that, that's really nice. I, I really like that system. Not Monero or Zcash, garbage. No offense. Spartacus, is there anything that I haven't asked you about Minima that you think it is important for our listeners to know? What has Minima 
had to sacrifice to do what it does. So it's not all fun and games. It's not all, hey, we've managed to crack this problem. We fixed everything. You know, we're not as powerful. You know, you can't do as much as you can do on Ethereum because look what happens when you do that. You know, this was told to them. It's like there's going to be too much stuff. You know, Ethereum computation engine versus verification engine. Yeah. So on Ethereum, you actually compute stuff. You don't want to compute stuff, not on layer one. You want to verify stuff. You want to do the computation off chain. So what have we had to sacrifice? And I guess the biggest thing is that Minima needs a lot of users. So Minima doesn't work with just five of us because there's no big miners sitting there protecting us. Yeah, the city of Minima, the city of Bitcoin and Ethereum has guards and they're powerful guards. Woo! And you just hope that they never turn around and go, oi, we're taking over. Yeah. Whereas the city of Minima is protected by the citizens of Minima which means that it doesn't work if there aren't enough of us. It means that Minima requires millions of users, billions of users. I mean, I, I don't see that as an issue. You know what I mean? You, you know, because it's a mobile application. Yeah, if I said you had to, if, if I said we have to install Minima on 100 million computers, I'd be like, forget about it. It's never happening. But if I said, look, I have to get 100 million downloads in the App Store, that happens every year. You know, there's always applications, you know, so it's that sort of convenience means that it is possible to for us to reach that level of, of usage. But that is the sacrifice we have had to make. Uh, I mean, I haven't even started to talk about IoT devices. You know, we've got Volvo and all these car people saying, hey, can we use it for this, that, for our cars to chat to each other and pay for electricity? And that's fine. And I do feel the M to M machine to machine market where each machine becomes a sovereign you know, independent economic unit on the network, yeah, where they actually pay for stuff themselves uh, because they're running a minimum node because it, you know, takes up no memory, it takes up like you know, 200 megabytes, great. Um, but that's the sacrifice we've had to make. Is that small enough for IoT devices, though? Like, I, you get I 256 like, megabytes on a SIM card. You get 256 okay. megabytes on a, on, a, on a SIM card. You know what I mean? I mean, Raspberry Pi, you know, is frankly about as you know we run on raspberry pi fine that's no problem um with optimization you know there's you know we, we've not had the billions of dollars of investment that some of the earlier chains you know during the 2017 you know craziness occurred but i know that with correct optimization you know and with a few more thousand man years uh we could definitely reach that sort of level easily the last question i have for you is how can people get involved uh, within the Minima community? How can they follow you guys on social media? How can they particularly keep tabs on what you're up to? Minima.global. Minima.global. I love it, not a .com. Nobody uses .com anymore. Yeah, so Minima.global is the website. We've got a Twitter thing. We've got a Discord with hundreds of thousands of users. Um, all of that information is there. Uh, come and join us. Come to the website. Download the application. You know, have a play. Tell us what you think. And um, yeah just the, the normal routes, but minima.global, all the information is there. And, you know, I'd love to see you there. Well, thank you so much for accepting the interview and coming on the show and talking all about Minima. Thank you so much. No, Ricardo, my pleasure. Really enjoyed it. Thank you.